We are all familiar with marketing. We no longer complain about commercials which are so intrusive in our daily life. We are okay with 30 minutes of interruption during your favorite movie or TV show. It's not a big deal anymore because we are ourselves being stuffed with information and we stuff others with applying filters on Instagram, with blurring the background and with exaggerating our lives, showing the best side of it. It's very rewarding nowadays to be a marketer. You can influence the minds of people and you can sell many things. However, what if these people, what if marketers have bigger ambitions than that? What if they would like to manipulate big crowds? Here comes propaganda. We are dealing with this notion and the first thought that comes to your mind, sure, is something negative. By definition, propaganda is something producing information which is already biased and misleading, that is aimed to promote somebody's ideas or position, sometimes at the expense of others. So, is it always so bad? And why should we care about it if we are not politicians? Today I will talk about propaganda and its methods of manipulation and how to avoid being the puppet in somebody's bloody hands. However, let's start with something easy and a clickbait. Emission levels that were already low have been further reduced by up to 15% in the new C-Class diesel. Oh, delicious. Oh, isn't that marvelous, dude? It's another car. Eh? Oh. Hopefully, one day, all diesels will be this clean. So, what did you feel and what did you infer from this video? Basically, we cannot stop watching the cute animals. They are so convincing. However, the ad itself is pretty arguable. It says that one brand of cars is better than others, is cleaner, and the competitors are just dirty diesels. We'll get back to this advertisement, but for now I would like to draw a clear line between marketing and propaganda, because these notions are really close to each other. So, when a guy comes to you and says, I'm a great lover, this is marketing. When a guy comes to you and repeats, I'm a great lover, trust me, I'm brilliant, I'm really the best lover ever, this is advertisement. When a friend of yours comes and says, look, this guy is a great lover, this is PR. And when you see the guy and you say, hmm, I know you're a great lover. This is branding. However, to describe propaganda, I need one more slide. Here we have three people. And when a guy comes to a girl and says, listen, I'm a great lover, but your boyfriend is not, this is already propaganda. Because propaganda can destroy. We have many examples in history when propaganda would exterminate groups of people, like Inquisition and Witch Hunt, when people were targeted because of some unusual skills. Or the prosecution of intellectuals in the Stalin's times, because they were called the foes of the nation. Or the oppression of Afro-Americans, because there was a theory that they intellectually impaired. So, the commercial we've seen is just a commercial. It's harmless. To make it propaganda, we would have to run over one of the hedgehogs with a rival car and call its brand. So, these notions are really close to each other. If we took the first four examples and compare them to martial arts, they will all belong to the same group of judo and karate and something like that. However, propaganda will be the MMI with low kicks and hard blows. So, the harmfulness of propaganda is obvious, however, they use similar techniques with commercials. They both advertise something, trying to promote some ideas or institutions or particular people. They all call us to action, to buy, to sell, 
to believe in something. And they all have measurable goals. We can calculate it by the number of votes, by the results of opinion polls, or by the number of sales. So based on this, of course, advertising is something milder than propaganda, but because of these similar techniques, we can easily analyze the first layers of persuasion on the example of the hedgehogs. And now we shall rip off these layers. So the first layer is our emotions. They appeal to us. It is cuteness. They are so amazing that we cannot stop watching them. The second part is humor. When you look at them, at their silly masks, when you listen to their funny voices, you feel entertained. And we all like to be entertained. Then we have expertise. Surely these creatures are the forest dwellers. And apparently they know the best what is good for wildlife. Then we have the opposition, we, they. We are the brands that produce good, clean cars. They produce dirty diesels. And last but not least, it is call to action, which is not so obvious here, but it still exists. While we are the only producer of clean diesels and others are still far behind, you should buy only our brand. So this is one of the example how propaganda and advertising can distort the information. There are other techniques, but the basic ones are this. We can show just a bit of it, a little picture of the reality. And once it is cropped, you can see the picture, which is quite reversed from the reality. We can also operate statistics and fact sheets, manipulating it. Have you heard the statistics about the average salary in your country? Does it really show the difference and division between the rich and the poor? Some experts compare average salary in the country to average body temperature of patients at hospital. You can also appeal to authority, like these funny hedgehogs. They are experts. We appeal to authority when we use celebrities or experts or our idols, because they cannot be wrong. We can also appeal to popularity. If the masses think so, if everybody does so, so they are right and I have to do the same. However, if these methods are so simple and obvious to you, propagandists have a bunch of more up their sleeve. There are about 20 basic techniques of manipulation used both verbally and visually, but I would like to focus on main five of them, which are most popular and most efficient and easy to grab. So the first one is called red herring. We are presenting irrelevant information to our people, especially when you don't like the topic, you don't want to answer it, you answer the question, or you simply don't want to be caught answering this question. So the best way is just to change the topic to something else. And politicians are very good at blabbing it. For example, we will not raise the salaries, but we still provide great benefits uh, for our employees. How come that in one sentence we have ended up in perks, but we no longer speak about uh, wage rise? If you want to blab people around and fool them, you can speak with overloaded vocabulary. You can dig something from the dictionary that the vocabulary is complicated, hard to grasp, and in the end, your audience will not follow you and you will not be able to recognize how come that from a simple question we have jumped over to just another topic. If you want to attack your opponent, you can use it with his own words. This technique is called a straw man. With a straw man, we mean that we take the words that have been said and just make wrong conclusions or paraphrase it in a way which is more beneficial for us. For example, first person, because of the thefts in our building, I think we should add more security cameras. This is a neutral statement. However, person number two says, so you are saying you don't trust your neighbors. Sometimes we can just jump at conclusions or oversimplify things. And this is also called a, a straw man, but in a little bit different version. For example, President Trump has been in office for a month 
and gas prices have been skyrocketing. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. We don't know. President Trump has been in power for only one month. And apparently, this is a complex notion. On second thought, probably President Trump alone is not the only reason for uh, this trouble. Another example is even more curious. The reason New Orleans was hit so hard with the Hurricane Katrina was because of all the immoral people who live there. It goes without saying when we are stressed out, the easiest way is to find fault with somebody else. This is how we survive the stress. However, blaming a certain group of people on a natural disaster, this is something not very logical. Once we blame somebody, it is very easy to call names and say that this person is bad and I'm good. This is called labeling. Labeling is something when we see a guy across the street and we call him a thief because he was spotted in a company of bad guys. Labeling and name calling was very popular during both world wars when Japanese or German soldiers were called rats or depicted as monsters on different posters. And this is quite natural for us because our brain builds certain connections, associations, what is good and what is bad. And once it is dragged from our memory, it is simply triggered and we no longer pay attention to the situation itself. We no longer bother to analyze it because we already know that once a fascist is something bad, it is true for the real story of people in World War II and this is also less true when we use it as a metaphor. The same mechanism applies to other metaphors like he's a real Scrooge or he's a real Rockefeller. We already know what the speaker is suggesting. Building molds and habits is, very useful, is a very useful mechanism which is created by our brain when we don't want to lose energy making decisions. It is, applies very well when we use some easy and repetitive tasks. However, this mechanism is well, well known also for propagandists. Another thing of naming or labeling is giving some opinionated sentences. The value judgment. For example, how stupid and pretty and pity things have become in Washington. So we don't know who is responsible for this. There are no names. Nobody can uh, find somebody's guilty. But if we put it in the right context, people already know who is there in Washington and who is there responsible for this. This sentence, even though just sounds neutral and affirmative, this is a very opinionated sentence due to the words stupid and pity, because these words bear negative connotation and they are encoded in our memory. And whatever we hear next time about people related to that situation in Washington, we will remember this stupid and pity. We can also use smear with different visual aids. These can be found in memes or taking photos of your opponents from some unfavorable angle. Once you have found somebody who is guilty, it is very easy to show it and reinforce it in a black and white manner. Because once you say a sentence which is black and white, you are sure that people will not argue with it. It is simply impossible to rebut. For example, I thought you were a good person, but you weren't at church today. This is not as hardcore as uh, other, uh, other cases I will show later, but in this case, we suggest that somebody who was not in church today is a bad person. But is it really true? Is there any law that says that a good person is somebody who goes to church? Or how many times do I have to go to church to be reckoned as a good person? So saying things black and white, the easiest way is to put it in some slogans, mottos or very short sentences which are easily remembered and easily repeated. And once repeated many times, again, we put them uh, in our subconsciousness and they are ready-made examples and templates just ready to be used on the right occasion. These are called slogans. There are different ways we can use slogans for. Some of them 
can, some of them can be rhymed, for example, um, it can be rhymed or can be uh, used as a kind of proverbs and sayings, saying some general truth that we all know. Another uh, one of the examples is make America great again. So this is an affirmative sentence and definitely this is something positive. Once you decide to rebut it, you will be already treated as somebody who is against America, because there is nothing bad in this sentence. Another example, patriotism means no questions. Try to doubt this. You are already put in the camp of the opponents. Or, entering this war will make us have a better future in our country. This slogan is quite interesting because it is more complicated than just an affirmative sentence saying, hooray, let's do something. This slogan appeals to our emotions. And our emotions here are based on general values. General values, these are the torchlights in our consciousness that light our road throughout life, that we know what is good and what is bad, what to believe and what to value. There are different examples of general values. You can see also on this slide, for example, the value of patriotism or the value of better future. Or another example that we have to be respectful to the elderly people, or we have to take care of children or our health, or we have to value education. Once we use these words, it is really hard to argue with them, because this is something we know by heart, and this is something which is handed over from generation to generation for thousands of years. That's why these slogans using general values can be very strong, can have a very strong influence uh, on our minds and our beliefs. So, how is it that wording is so powerful? Why is that that copywriters agonize for hours for taglines that can be only five words long? Again, it's because the structures that we build in our memory from the very beginning, when a toddler starts to learn its first vocabulary. It starts to learn the basic words and then what is good and what is bad. It is crucial for a little child because this is the matter of his survival. He should know the rules, how to survive in his society, in the group of people he finds himself. Therefore, with words, we learn how to perceive this world. We build a 3D picture knowing that snow is something white and cold, or that sweet is something pleasant, or that warm is better than cold. Therefore, these ready-made templates are so powerful. Words stay in our memory much longer after the picture is faded. And of course, when stakes are high, when we speak about information wars, when the political agendas are changing so rapidly and can be so aggressive, words really cost a lot. Sometimes people underestimate it. We blab something, we don't pay attention to it. But words forged empires and toppled nations because words can rally people against each other, even to the extent of the extermination of some of the group. So, can it be that a bulletin can be fair? Unfortunately, it's never fair. And it's up to you to be realistic and very critical to what you read and what you perceive. Because when stakes are high, politicians will do their best to drag you to their side. And what you can do is just be very mindful of what you read and what you get as information food. And every time you read something, try to cross-check this information. Try to double-check and read it the same thing from different sources. Of course, you can be manipulated anytime, but at least try to draw conclusions from what you hear or what you read. And then maybe you will see who is benefiting from this or that particular viewpoint. So remember, we are in the state of information war and that all is fair in war in love. 
So you are in the middle of a battlefield when, when the opponents are shelling with irrefutable arguments against each other. It's only you to be there on the alert. Thank you.